We looked quite a while ago now, a younger version of myself looked at modes of operation, which is how we combine a block cipher like AES into a workable encryption scheme that we can use, let's say for internet traffic. And actually the most prevalent form of authentication online now is AES GCM, which is AES in Galois counter mode. Now we mentioned Galois counter mode very briefly in passing, but I thought given how important it is and how much we use it, like, you know, if you're looking at a video now, the likelihood is it's encrypted using AES GCM. Maybe it's worth asking, you know, what is that, right? And why is it useful? Let's look very briefly back at counter mode, which is how we use AES to encrypt a stream. And then we can show what's wrong with it and what Galois counter mode adds to that. You've got a block cipher that encrypts um, 128 bits at a time. That, a lot of block ciphers do this, they have different block lengths, but AES is 128 bits. If you want to use AES on anything that isn't 128 bits, you're going to need to pad to a multiple of a block length, and you're going to need to have some kind of scheme that you can use to apply it multiple times. And there are, as we've seen in the previous video, there are good ways to do this and there are very bad ways to do this. Right, so let's just very quickly recap counter mode, because we're going to extend that into Galois counter mode. We've got our encryption using our block cipher, so this is our encryption using key K, and we might have multiple blocks encrypted this way. Now, your first thought would be, well, let's just put the plain text in here and get out the cipher text, but that's ECB mode, and that's very weak. Counter mode uses a, an initializer, a random initializer, to make sure that your encryption stream is different every time. So we'll call that N, right? It's so our number used once or our nonce, right? And that's used to make sure that the encryption scheme is different every time, and we have to absolutely make sure that you don't use the same pair K and N again. What you do is you start off your encryption by saying, okay, so this is N plus naught, and this is N plus one, and N plus two, all the way along your stream. And what you're essentially doing is actually not encrypting your message at all. You're encrypting this counter, right? This random and this counter, and that produces a string of random noughts and ones. So naught, one, one, naught, 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 one, 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 naught, one, naught, right? For 128 bits. And AES is very, very good. So even if you put in a very, let's say your, your N is zero, and you do, you'll get a very, very different output here than you will here and here and so on. It looks very, very random, and that's very helpful. And then actually for encryption, we're gonna use good old XOR. Right? So we're gonna say, okay, here's our message, message one. This is gonna come in here. We're going to XOR it with this, and that gives us our ciphertext one. And we're going to do the same thing. So message two, ciphertext two, and then uh, M3. I could have done two blocks and it would have been quicker. C3. So this is a fine scheme, right? Because what this does, if these counters, if this N is random, right, we're not going to be able to predict what they are. The K is a secret. So this, essentially this key stream here, these zeros and ones here, here, and here are also a secret, which means that the encryption using XOR here is a secret. And so you can look at C1, C2, and C3, but have no idea how to get back to M1, M2, and M3. And this is also quite fast. You can parallelize it and things like this. The problem is that it has this issue that stream, all stream ciphers have, because this is converting AES into a stream cipher, that it's not protecting the ciphertext. And what does that mean? Well, it means that if, if you think about how the decryption would work here, we're actually going to reverse these arrows. So we're still going to produce the exact same key stream, it's just we're going to put the ciphertext in and get out the message. The XOR reverses its effect the second time. So that means that suppose I change some of the bits as an attacker in C2, those exact corresponding bits are going to flip in M2 because of the way the XOR works. And so even though I couldn't read this message, I could affect it. And it's very difficult to tell that that's happened. It might be that your message no longer makes sense, but it might be that the recipient of the bank, bank transaction has now changed to me, right? And that's great for me, but not for anyone else. What we need to do, and what I mentioned in the previous video, is we need to add something here that computes some kind of checksum or other cryptographic tag of some description that says you can check against this and say, okay, these haven't been changed. They're secret, we know that, and they haven't been changed. And then you've got the best of both worlds. You've got something that you can't read and something you can't manipulate. So this is what Galois counter mode does. When you see AES GCM, that's the advanced encryption standard in Galois counter mode, what you're actually saying is we're using AES to perform this encryption, but we're using counter mode and we're calculating this Galois 
mathematics across these ciphertexts to make sure that they also haven't been changed. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Just think sort of as a sort of high level what we're trying to do here. What we want to do is have some kind of tag, which I'm going to draw in a box here. Right? And this tag needs to summarize all of this so that if any of this gets changed, when you recreate this process during encryption, your tag is going to be different to this tag, and you can go, whoa, stop there, right? Someone's been fiddling about, right? That's the idea. This is an authenticated encryption scheme. And so the idea is that when you decrypt, so when you encrypt, you create this tag at the same time you're encrypting. When you decrypt, you're going to check against this tag and make sure that it hasn't been changed, right? And that's part of the process. If you actually use this in a library, they'll often raise an exception if a tag has been changed in any way. Right? So what do we need to make sure hasn't been changed? Well, is it the plain text? Not really, because the plain text is not being sent to the recipient, so they can't recompute the tag. I suppose they could decrypt it and check, but it's easier, given that the plain text and the ciphertext are inherently related, just to authenticate the ciphertext. Let's draw in orange um, the bits we want to authenticate. So we want to authenticate the ciphertext. We also really don't want people fiddling around with this number used once either. So ideally, we would, we would authenticate this number used once. And that way, the encryption key is already known, actually, to both parties. So we don't need to authenticate that, although that's sort of implicit in this system. The other thing you might want to authenticate is the length of the message, because the length tells you that you, know, you haven't accidentally removed this one or inserted some, some more data or something like this. And so this is what we're doing as well. The way that AASGCM is going to work is it's first going to calculate what we call our, um, our authentication key or our hash key. Right? So this is going to be used in computing this T based on these. Right? And we call this H. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 128 zeros. So 000, 000 128 times. I've run out of paper, right? And we're going to encrypt that using AES and that's going to give us H, okay? And you can ignore this arrow because it's got nothing to do with it, right? Now that hash key is a secret. It's it's deterministically generated from our encryption key because it's just encrypting all zeros. But remember, AES is very good. So when you encrypt all zeros, you're unlikely to get all zeros back again. You're going to get something random looking. So we've got a random looking string of 128 zeros and ones. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take our first counter. Um, and so actually, I need to change my indices now, right? Because I totally messed them up. And you've already noticed that this doesn't match this, right? So let's say this is counter one, this is two, this is three, right? And we'll pretend that didn't happen. What we're going to do is we're going to take n plus naught, we're going to put this through our encryption scheme, and then we're going to pass it down over here. And we're going to join this in at the end, right? Over here like this. It's going to be used on our tag, okay? And what that's going to do is protect this secret H from being recomputed within here, right? Now, what we're going to do now is for each ciphertext, we're going to add it to our existing tag, which coming in is zero, and then we're going to multiply it by H. Now, you might think, how do you multiply two 128-bit numbers together? Well, actually, the answer is you do it in what we call a Galois field, right? So this is some finite field arithmetic, which maybe we can throw in some extra bits, but in essence, it's very similar to the mathematics of AES. It's just the 128-bit version instead of the 8-bit version, which we were seeing in AES. In essence, you treat these values as polynomials, so you know x squared plus 1, multiply them together and then you reduce them. And so whenever you multiply this by this or this by this, you will get another 128-bit value, which sort of looks a bit random. It's a kind of... It's like a modular. modular. It's very much like modular. It's just slightly more complicated than just a remainder after division when you, when you have integers. But it's very, very similar in terms of the way that it works. So what we do is we take this uh, ciphertext, we're going to multiply it, and I'm going to use the confusing x symbol for multiplication, which is not the same as XOR, it's rotated. <laughs> and we're going to put H in here, like this. And then we're going to take this, and we're going to... I've realised I've not left myself enough room, but we'll make it work. So we're going to XOR this in here, and then this is going to be multiplied by H, and then it sort of works. It's not very elegant, is it? If you look online, they have much neater diagrams that they've done in vector graphics and everything. Uh, so, and then this, this comes out here, and it goes in here, and it's going to be multiplied by H. So what are we doing? Well, every time we're adding this value into our tag, we're making sure that this value is represented in the ultimate tag that we're producing. By multiplying by H, 
we're essentially adding some secrecy, right? The idea is that you can't just trivially recompute this tag by XORing these together or doing some other sort of trivial computation to work out what the tag would be. And given that H is based on our secret key, it's going to be hard for any attacker to do this. Now we want to finally authenticate our length. So we're going to take our length, which is, which is the length of our message in any other data we have, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and we're going to take this and we're going to XOR it in like this, and we're going to do one final multiplication by H. And then finally, and I've, I've realized I've not left enough room at all, we're, we're going to take this masking key here and we're going to sort of squeeze it in via another XOR, and that gives us our tag. Does that, yeah, you, you can fix that in post, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, now, why, so what this is doing is protecting this equation, essentially. This is a large equation that we've calculated based on our ciphertext and based on our value H. Encrypting this nonce here and putting it in masks that and makes it hard to recompute. Right? So what have we got by doing this? Well, if you change the, the key, none of these values are going to match up. Your encryption is going to fail. That's good. If you change any of the ciphertext in transit, so let's say you intercept the message, you fiddle around with a few bits with a view to attacking it, well, this sum is going to now be different. And so this tag is no longer going to match. And if you change the number used once or any other part of your scheme, that's going to happen, right? So during decryption, what you're going to do is the exact opposite. You're going to take your ciphertext, you're going to XOR it with your key stream and get your message back. But while you're doing that, you're also going to compute this sum here and derive your tag. And then before you return any data to the user, you're going to go, right, does that tag that I received match the tag that I've just computed? And if it doesn't, you know something funny has gone on, right? Now, it could be a mistake just in transit, or it could be something malicious. Because we've authenticated the length here, we also know that we're not, that, you know, no one's removed this or added another message in blocking here or something like that, right? And that's something you'd want to avoid. Well, I'm thinking, how often is this happening? So we kind of like, um, imagine I'm downloading a website. Yeah, yeah. Is that like once for every website or is it for every block or is it for every chunk of... It's once for literally every message you ever send, right? It's, which, so when I say it's prevalent, I, it, I really mean it, right? This is every time you send a packet that's encrypted, unless you're splitting your data over multiple packets, which for the sake of argument, let's say you're not, it's every message. If you download an image off the internet, you do it. If you download, if you send a get request to the internet, you do it, right? Every time you send a message, you always compute a tag like this, so that on the other end they can say, okay, no one's changed anything. And you've got to think, actually, think about how, how important this would be. If, this, if we didn't have this process, so I could flip bits here and your message would decrypt, you could change credit card details when they were going along, you could change bank accounts, you could change people's passwords, you could do all kinds of weird attacks that would, let's say it, we just don't want them to happen. And so, if you, if you calculate this tag, what you do is you get that assurance that this message is unchanged from what the sender actually hoped you were going to get. So it's, it's basically like a very, not, it's like a complicated seal on an envelope, right? It is like a complicated seal. The, the important thing is, actually, and perhaps this is something I should have mentioned, right? But the important thing is that as an attacker, you shouldn't be able to recompute this. So let's think about how that would happen. Well, I know the ciphertext. I know the nonce because it's not a secret, right? I don't know the encryption key. Okay, so what, let's suppose I want to flip a few bits here and recompute this tag so that I can supply a valid tag, which is essentially an attack, a reasonable attack on, on, on GCN. What I would need to be able to do is work out what H is because then I, then I can recompute it. You know, I can calculate all of this, including my altered C3 if I wanted to, as long as I have H but I don't have H because H is the secret encryption of zeros. It's based on my key, yeah, the encryption of, of, of you under my key. And so as an attacker, it's going to be extremely difficult to recompute this tag unless you can obtain H and there are some attacks, right? So for example, suppose, you, suppose this number used once, suppose you think, well, that can't be right, let's use it twice, right? A number used twice, um, then you are in real trouble because you can XOR the two messages together and you can essentially remove this tag right and you can then find using essentially a standard polynomial root finding algorithm what h is and once you know h you can start recomputing altered messages change length messages anything you like and attack the system which is a real problem perhaps the one thing that's worse than someone tampering with your messages would be someone tampering with your messages but you don't know about it right because then you don't know to discard that message right that's a huge problem so, um, 
ASGCM is really, really important. And actually, the only other alternative, really, that's in modern use is Char Char 20 Poly 1305. We've already talked about the Char Char 20 cipher. The Poly 1305 message authentication code is a similar principle to this. And the idea is that you have that tag at the end that you can verify the message hasn't been changed. So if you go on your browser now and you look at your security tab, you'll see, in all likelihood, it's done this. Right, and many, many times just while you've been watching this video. So what I haven't mentioned and what will probably be driving some people very cross in the comments is that you can actually stick other data in here in this bit where I've uh, admittedly not left myself enough room. Right? So I'm going to use my smallest of writing to do this. But you can imagine a situation where maybe you want to encrypt some data, but you don't want to encrypt all of the data, but you still don't want that other non-secret data being changed. So for example, imagine you have a packet of data on the internet where the first part is the header, which is where you're sending it, and the second part is your encrypted payload. You can't encrypt the header because the header's the address, right? But on the other hand, you don't want people spoofing the header or changing the header in any way, and so you'd really like to authenticate that as well. Maybe you have a database record and you're keeping the primary key authenticated but not encrypted, and you're encrypting some of the sort of personal details, let's say. So what we have here is something called, and I'm gonna draw it in A, a, D, and I'm going to draw it in orange because it's also authenticated, but it's not encrypted. So this is an example of an AEAD, or Authenticated Encryption with Associated Data Scheme. This is additional authenticated data. And the idea is that we add this into our tag and multiply by H in exactly the same way. Right? And I absolutely have not left myself enough room. So this would be, this would come down here, it would be multiplied by H, and then it will come up here and be XORed in with our ciphertext. And you can do this for any number of blocks of associated data as well. And that means that now this is also protected. So you would, you, if you were sending this message on the internet, you would send your public number used once, you'd send any associated data, and you would send all your ciphertext, and then that is enough information for the person on the other end of the line to decrypt the message, look at this if they need to, and verify the tag. Right? So, um, that's why this is called an AEAD cipher. And actually, if you use something like TLS 1.3, that's all there is now available, right? Char Char 20 Poly 1305, ASGCM, these are two AEAD ciphers, and those are the only two available. What does the tag look like? Is it literally just a string of numbers? Good question. So it's 128 numbers, right, zeros and ones. Often, we might truncate the tag just to make it a little bit more manageable to 96 bits but you've got to consider you don't want to truncate it too much because if you only took the first bit of a tag, then you've got a 50-50 chance of calculating a matching tag on, a, on an altered message. So essentially the length of a tag is something you'd have to decide. To be honest, I would just use 128 bits because it's, space in, in most internet traffic is not that much of a premium, right? You know, those extra few bits at the end are not, are not really worth worrying about. Some of the rounds we do in columns, so we mix A, B, C, and D. And then we mix this column, and then we mix this column, A, B, C, and D, and this column. Sometimes we mix diagonals. ASGCM uses GF2 to the 128, which is a big version of the 2 to the 8. 